Welcome to the second segment about institutional review boards. Uh, you recall when we ended the first segment, we were introducing these three categories of activities, uh, providing standard care, the, the usual way uh, that a clinician treats a patient, uh, providing non-standard care. So this would still be an interaction for clinical care purposes, but an instance in which the type of care you provide is not the usual type of care. So it could be similar to, for example, what Dr. Rousey was doing uh, in his unusual way to do a uh, corneal transplant. And then the third category, which is not in the clinical setting, which is research. And we're going to say more about the difference in particular between research and the other two categories. So before we saw that Dr. Rousey had been found to be conducting research, category three, but I left you with two questions asking, what if he had done things a little differently so that he was actually ending up in category two, namely providing non-standard care? And the question is, in terms of whether what he was doing was acceptable, would that have made a difference? And that's what we want to explore now. And here are the two questions I left you with. You know, why did everybody seem to think it was really, really important to prove that he was doing research? And what if, again, he had actually changed what he did in a hypothetically different scenario, didn't keep research records, merely told his patients that it was a new experimental technique. Genuinely, he was not trying to learn new information, and all he was trying to do was do what he thought was the best treatment for them, which would ideally plop him in that middle category of providing non-standard care. And the question is, would this have altered the wrongness of what he was doing? And by understanding the answer to that question, we could get a better understanding, hopefully, of why we have separate rules for research. Again, would it have been okay if he was just providing non-standard care? And perhaps he was just careless in doing too many research-like things that ended up putting him in the category of providing research instead of providing non-standard care. So that's what I want to explore now. And I know this is a somewhat wordy slide, so you don't have to read the whole thing, but basically this is describing um, a New England Journal article, a relatively prominent one from a, a very well-known and distinguished um, bioethics professor, Bob Trug, and he's talking about a paradox, and he didn't invent a paradox. This actually gets discussed quite often, and it, it's a very interesting scenario, and you'll see, I think, it's relevant to what Dr. Rousey did. So what Dr. Trug was talking about in his article was, imagine that a physician reading about some new method for treating his patients, and according to Dr. Trug, um, the physician could just actually start using it on his patients, even though, again, this would be non-standard care, um, as long as he gets their consent and kind of tells them, look, this is a little unusual, this is not the standard treatment, but I think this is a good way to treat you. But on the other hand, if the physician thinks about doing a randomized controlled trial to compare two different ways of treating something. And he gives an example here of, of using two different antibiotics, both of which are, are often used for treating bronchitis, and you want to see which of them is better. What if you do conduct a randomized controlled trial? Well, Dr. Trug notes that to actually do this as research, you would probably have to prepare a formal protocol, obtain approval from the Institutional Review Board, again, or some sort of similar ethics review committee, and seek written informed consent. So an actual written consent form for this particular study. And he finds the difference between these two scenarios um, unusual and perhaps troubling. And here's his summary of what he's talking about here. If a physician wants to do just therapeutic innovation, what we were calling providing non-standard care, that the clinical way of doing an unusual treatment, um, his claim is a physician could do all they want uh, as long as they're not trying to gain knowledge, namely not trying to put it in the category of research or third category, or the way he puts it, I need permission to give a drug to half my patients, but not to give it to all of them. And clearly you could see his take on this, that that sounds a little puzzling because the better thing to do is actually to do the research and to try to learn more and answer the research question. That would seem to be a good thing. So why are there all these administrative you know, barriers to, to doing that that make it much harder to do that as opposed to just giving it to your patients, which sounds less appropriate. And so let's try to 
to delve into that question and ask ourselves, is it true what Dr. Trug is saying, that physicians can do most anything they want in the name of therapeutic innovation, but only if there's no attempt to gain systematic knowledge from the intervention? And, and my claim is that he's wrong. And if you at least appreciate why he's wrong, this will actually help you understand why we have institutional review boards. And in particular, what are the rules that the IRBs are asked to enforce? And to understand this, we, we particularly have to understand the rules for that middle category, that category of providing non-standard care. And so remember our slide, we had the two categories at the top, providing non to providing standard care in a clinical scenario and providing non-standard care, our second category, also in the clinical scenario. So those are both the clinical care and research is the third. Well, if we look at the first two categories, what I'm claiming is that the general current rules for providing that kind of care, the ethical rules and also the legal rules are that the patient always is number one, that basically the clinician has to do everything to advance the best interests of the patient. That's certainly true. I mean, that dates back, what, thousands of years to the time of Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Oath. And, and that same concept is deeply embedded in our current ethical and legal rules for protecting patients. And what I want to point out in particular is this is also the rule for providing non-standard care. Anytime a clinician tries to provide non-standard care for a patient, the rule, the ethical rule, the legal rule is still that the patient is number one. And let's hold off on the research rule for a moment. And just to explain this to you, I'll explain a little further. Ask yourself what would happen if a doctor fails to follow the patient number one rule. And in general, that's considered malpractice. Um, and does the fact that the patient gave consent fully absolve the doctor? And remember what Dr. Trug was saying in his New England Journal article. He was saying he could get general consent and, and provide any sort of you know, innovative care he wants to his patient, and, and you're good to go. And that's just wrong. In general, merely providing informed consent is not going to fully absolve the doctor if what the doctor is doing is viewed as inappropriate. And, and I have an example of that, and, and this is a real example. There was a woman named Barbara Rojas uh, who was in the United States, and, and she was very obese, but she, she managed, after a great deal of work, to successfully lose huge amounts of weight. And often when that happens, you'd end up with these long, drooping uh, pieces of pendulous skin. And uh, to get that skin removed, you need a great deal, a, a massive surgical procedure. Um, and she did not have a lot of money, and she was originally from Ecuador. And in, in the Ecuadorian community that she lived, there was a, a, a man, Guillermo Falcone, um, who had been trained as a physician in Ecuador, but was not licensed in the U.S. But he actually let people in, in the community know that he would do surgery in people's bedrooms. And he did this procedure. Um, she ended up hemorrhaging. In fact, she hemorrhaged and died in, in front of her daughter. Um, and he ended up going to jail. And again, that's very unusual, a physician going to jail for this sort of thing, but it's just demonstrating the fact that she gave consent is irrelevant. He could have gotten marvelous consent. He could have told it her very, very clearly all of the risks and it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been inappropriate for him to, to do such a risky procedure in her bedroom. Uh, Dr. Rousey, in fact, did end up being sued by at least two patients claiming malpractice. And in terms of the rules for when a physician can provide non-standard care, and again, we're not talking about doing research, we're talking about providing clinical care, but an unusual type of clinical care. And the question will be, in terms of the best interest of the patient, is it reasonable for the clinician to depart from standard care, and is it reasonable for them to provide this unusual uh, type of care. And what you'd actually be doing in terms of figuring out the appropriateness of this departure from standard care is you'd be looking at the risks of this unusual treatment versus the possible benefits to that patient. And all of this would be from the viewpoint of the patient, whether in fact this change is good for the patient. Remember, the rule we're applying in that middle category is still the patient is number one. So now let's turn to research. And what I want to claim is that the rules, the ethical rules for this are very, very different. And 
the reason is there's is a societal interest in, in doing research. But to do research, it often will be the case that you're not going to be able to do the research and still have the patient being number one. So in effect, a researcher is under a different set of rules. And a good way to think about it is the researcher is actually under a relaxed set of rules where it is no longer the case that the patient is number one. So note a very big departure from our first two categories where the patient was always number one. You're, you're, the researcher is allowed to deviate from the Hippocratic Oath rule, basically. This is a big, big change. And the result of this is, is note that there is a conflict of interest under which the researcher operates. The researcher is trying to pursue two different goals. One is to answer the research question, and often that's the primary goal of the researcher. That's why they're doing the research. And in some particular types of research, particularly in clinical trials, there's another goal of trying to treat the patient. And the problem is that trying to advance one goal, namely answering the research question, can be in conflict with the goal of treating the patient. You're not going to always be able to do both at the same time. And we have special research rules to deal with this conflict of interest. And in and, and here, we're just trying to spell out the variety of ways that the researcher, unlike the clinician, is allowed to do things that can be bad for the patient. And here are a, a number of examples. So, for example, randomization. You know, in terms of clinical care, physicians will rarely randomize a patient. Even if there's uncertainty about which, about which treatment is best, a clinician will often, you know, make their best judgment and explain to a patient why one or another treatment might be better. They normally won't randomize. Um, second category here, here, standardization. In a research study, you often want all the research subjects to get similar treatments except for the one aspect that you're studying, the one that you're having different treatments in the two arms of the study, the one you're randomizing. So we don't um, fine tune the care for the patient in the way we normally would as part of uh, usual standard care. Uh, number three, often it will be the case that in the middle of a study, we actually have interim results that may be strongly pointing toward one or another of the uh, treatments being studied being better in the end, but we're still continuing to study to get the appropriate level of statistical uh, differences between the two arms. We do not disclose those interim results to the patients because often uh, the result of that would be they would leave the trial and just take whichever treatment is uh, leading to be better. And fourth, and, and often this is the most common thing, being in a research study, there will often be extra tests and procedures that are being conducted just to generate information that will help answer the research question. They will often not be relevant to the actual treatment that the patient, in this case, the research subject, is getting. And in fact, they may impose uh, risks and burdens on that uh, research subject. So again, these are examples of the different categories of ways in which the researcher may be doing something that is not ideal and not, may not be even good for the patient. Um, we have special research regulations that help allow the research to go forward and allow it to go forward under a set of rules in which the interests of the patient are no longer number one. But on the other hand, we don't want to inappropriately uh, do uh, too many bad things to patients. So the research regulations are designed to manage that conflict of interest and make sure that the goal of answering the research question doesn't inappropriately override the patient's best interests. And just to demonstrate this is not hypothetical, that there is a need for these rules, let me just give you some examples. Um, here are researchers who did some high-altitude experiments to see uh, how well human beings could endure at extremely high altitudes, and so they placed research subjects in low-pressure chambers and simulated uh, an increase in altitude. Uh, there were freezing experiments to see how to treat people who've been severely chilled or frozen. And in one set of experiments, they put people in tanks of ice water for hours at a time or kept them naked outdoors for in freezing temperatures. Um, 
uh, sulfa experiments and an studying an antibiotic, and they intentionally inflicted wounds on subjects with a variety of types of bacteria, and they tied off the blood vessels so no blood was going to the wounds, and they would infor, uh, force wood shavings or glass into the wounds, and then they saw if the infections could be treated with sulfa and other drugs. And finally, her experiments with poisons, in which they actually um, secretly administered poisons to uh, subjects in their food, and uh, some victims died or were killed to, per to permit autopsies. Um, you may have uh, guessed or knew uh, that these were experiments done uh, in Nazi Germany before and during World War II, um, and these uh, this was considered so horrible that it led to one of the earlier codes for uh, protecting uh, subjects and what's called the Nuremberg Code. And I would strongly encourage you uh, at some point or another to actually sit down and spend a few minutes going through the code because even now, and this is what, 70 years or so after the code was written, it still has the core concepts of why we have different rules for uh, research. And the first rule, and this is the longest rule, is that we need to get the consent of the human subject. And, and if you, again, don't worry about reading it now, but at, at your leisure time, take a look at this rule because it actually has all the concepts we have currently about informed consent, which is often the most important aspect of ethically doing research with human subjects. Ideally, let the person know what they're getting into and they get to decide whether or not this is what they want. So that's part one of the Nuremberg Code. There are only 10 parts to Nuremberg Code. All the other nine parts are shorter. And by and large, all the rest are uh, rules about how the experiment could be designed and what makes it ethical. I'll particularly note number five on this slide, noting that if there's a possibility that, a serious possibility, death or disabling injury will occur to the subjects, well, maybe a better way to do that is only in the experiments where the physicians themselves will all also serve as subjects. Uh, not clear we would view this as a great rule these days, but it's interesting that they uh, pose that. Um, and this is just uh, the rest of the, 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 the nine provisions adding up to 10 together with informed consent. And you'll see these are basically all about uh, different ways to design the study. Uh, in the U.S., there was the famous Tuskegee study uh, where African-American men who had syphilis um, uh, were followed to see the progression of that disease. And even after uh, it was discovered that penicillin might be a treatment for it, uh, the, the people conducting the study uh, worked to make sure that these men did not know that penicillin uh, was a possible treatment for their medical condition. Um, so that was considered, and it was, extremely outrageous, uh, just to demonstrate a number of other examples within the U.S. Uh, there's a Jewish chronic disease hospital in which patients were injected with cancer cells, live cancer cells from other patients, but where they're not told about it because the notion was that the researchers thought they would get anxious about this, which of course they would, but there was a good reason that they might not want to have this happen to themselves. Um, a Cincinnati General Hospital study where patients with cancer got their whole body irradiated with radiation, not just the part where the cancer was, and they were not told that this was about protecting uh, the U.S. troops and learn about the effect of nuclear bombs and radiation on the troops. Um, Here's another study in Oregon State, uh, people in prison, and they volunteered to have their testicles irradiated, and a part of a study involved a mandatory vasectomy to prevent contamination of the genetic pool. Um, and finally, uh, there were quite a few studies that the uh, US CIA conducted uh, to counter Soviet and Chinese advances in brainwashing and interrogation techniques. And the subjects were often unaware, and some of them actually died. So the bottom line is that, as we saw, researchers often have a conflict of interest. Their activities in, in designing and conducting a study to answer research questions can often, uh, if enough appropriate rules are not in place, end up harming their, the, the subjects. Um, as these examples demonstrate, the historical examples, these conflicts can lead to very real harms. And we create special research rules about how to conduct research to manage these conflicts and to reduce the harms.
I hope you found this segment to be valuable. If you have any questions about it, uh, please contact the program coordinator. Thank you.